Today's lecture is going to start exploring what we've learned about various environments by using the new tools of microbial ecology. The first place that we're going to start is acid mines. And you might wonder, why are we starting here first? Well, that's where the research actually started first. Dr. Jillian Banfield and her research group was one of the first to start investigating various environments using these new methods. And they chose acid mines because it was a pollution problem. Acid mines and mining involves digging. And when you dig, you'll often expose minerals to air. So as you can see in this figure, you have the mining area up here. There's various holes dug in the ground and then water comes in and drains out through it. So water is washing through. The temperature is about four to 37 degrees centigrade. But when this water comes out here, it's rust colored and then it has a pH of zero to one. So the question was, why is this happening and is there anything we could do about it? So Dr. Banfield's group could get money to investigate this. So they did. They found out there is a microbial role. Microbes accelerate iron oxidation rates at low pH by five orders of magnitude. Microbial activity was accountable for 75% of acid mine drainage. And by classic culture techniques, it seemed like acetylthiobacillus was a major player in this. But it turned out after this investigations using new modern techniques, it's not a major player. It was found that the primary microbial groups are lithotropes. So what were these doing? They were oxidizing iron sulfide or iron pyrite. You might know it as fool's gold. This oxidation releases sulfuric acid by microbial action. There's further chemical oxidation releasing iron three and that will react with water to form a rust colored precipitate and that's what you see in the water and then that reaction makes acid so here's the whole overall process so these iron three plus will get reduced as it reacts with iron sulfide to release sulfuric acid and iron two plus this iron two plus is used by bacteria plus oxygen and it re-oxidizes the iron so it can go through another round of pyrite dis dissolution. So the microbes are actually doing an oxidation of the iron and then there's a chemical reaction that actually causes the, react the release of sulfuric acid. They did 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing, amplicon sequencing, and what they found is one of the major groups that was unique was nitrospira and 75% of the biomass that they found was leptospirum group 2 10% was leptospirum group 3 they recently cultured this group due to its ability to fix nitrogen which they discovered as they did more work on the DNA that they discovered from it and they found that it's responsible for biofilm formation and fix nitrogen for the community there are also firmicutes, which is another phyllotype, and, of, and most of those are sulfobacillus. And then there were some unique species that had never been found before. Now, this is in the bacteria. So what have we learned from this environment? The primary producers are mostly chemolithal autotrophs. They get their energy from chemicals, the oxidation of the iron pyrite, and other sulfur compounds. They get their carbon from CO2 and they can fix nitrogen using nitrogen fixation. So they get it, their nitrogen from nitrogen gas. Some growth of chemo heteroautotrophs are off the dissolved organic carbon that's present. So when the chemo lithoautotrophs die, their carbon will be degraded by chemo heterotrophs. And we'll talk about those in a second. Let's talk a little bit about the autotrophic growth. The autotrophs are really important since there's very little organic carbon in these rocky areas, right? Water's just flowing over rocks. Many species are actually autotrophs. The Leptospirillum, Ferroplasma, Sulfobacillus, Ferromicrobium, Acidomicrobium, so lots of them. Their CO2 fixation is by the Calvin cycle and by a cycle called reverse TCA cycle. And we'll talk about those cycles a little bit more 
when we talk about the carbon cycle later in this module. Leptospirulum peroxidans is a gram-negative spiral-shaped organism. You can see a picture of it here. It's a chemolithal autotroph and it oxidizes iron with oxygen. It is the dominant species, as I said before. Its CO2 fixation is by the reduced TCA cycle, and it's somewhat similar to acetylthiobacillus peroxidans. They have been able to isolate this organism and sequence its entire DNA, and then, as we talked about in Module 8, they've gone through, predicted the functions of all the proteins, put them into pathways, and made some estimates about what it can do. Its energy generation is by the oxidation of iron, and that's shown here, right? And it uses the reverse TCA cycle. You can see this here in the bottom, and it's running the TCA cycle backwards, adding two CO2s, and then acetyl-CoA comes off the pathway and then goes into the rest of metabolism. Now, we've talked about this pathway before when we talked about respiration, but here it is again. Now, again, this is the pathway for acetylthiobacillus peroxidans, but when you compare these proteins to what's present on the leptospirillum chromosome and the genes that they have, it turns out it really appears like they have a very similar pathway. So what I want you to do is look at this and compare and contrast iron oxidation with oxidative phosphorylation using the table below. Okay, I've given you a minute to do that. Uh, if Please pause and finish the table if you're not done. And here's what I came up with. If you look at this, the, the NADH dehydrogenase complex is similar. The BC1 complex is similar to oxidative phosphorylation. You have a quinone pool and ATP synthesis. So they're all very similar. The differences are the things that are in the periplasm and the outer membrane. CYC2, Rus, and then interestingly, the reverse flow of electrons through the BC1 complex, the quinones, and, in, and NADH dehydrogenase. You're actually making NADH by running in this way. And that's because they have this giant proton gradient from pH 2 to pH 6.5, so they can drive that synthesis. Now, there are other organisms that are there. One of them is Ferroplasma acidomerinus, and this is found in many acid mines. 80% of them will have this, and it uses the reactions talked about in the previous slide to oxidize iron pyrite and release sulfuric acid. Interestingly, this organism has no cell wall, and in this case, it uses the reductive acetyl-CoA pathway to synthesize its carbon. It takes CO2, runs it through this pathway into acetyl-CoA, and then into central metabolism. It lives in pH ranges of 0.1 to 2.5 pH, so very, very acidic. Now, you may be thinking that only bacteria are going to be able to survive in this environment, or archaea, and it turns out that's simply not the case. Eukaryotes can also survive in these acid mines. They will grow chemoheterotrophically, and they grow on dead primary producers. So the primary producers, the leptospirilla, the ferroplasmas, will grow for a while, some of them will die, and that carbon is released and then available to these chemoheterotrophs. There are fungi that can grow this way. There are also proteins that graze on the bacteria and limit the population growth of this, these biofilms. And again, remember the pH of these environments is one. So that's pretty amazing. One thing I do want to talk about before we move on to the next environment is what a phylotype is. What you'll hear me talk about a lot is species such as Leptospirillum peroxidans. And I will also talk maybe about some of the common phylotypes. And I'll think, say things like nitro, Nitrospira. That is a phylotype, and just to give you a comparison what that means, a species would be Homo sapiens, its phylotype would be Mammalia. So that gives you a concept of you know, how we're grouping them. And also remember, most of these phylotypes, in a metabolic sense, don't mean anything. Just like 
just because you're mammal doesn't mean that you all look the same. There's very different types of mammals, etc. Having said that, one of the other things we want to talk about is we've talked about common phylotypes, all right? And you're going to find very common phylotypes of actinobacteria, firmicutes, proteobacteria, and acidobacteria. These groups will be found in many habitats. The proportions and players will change. In the acid mine, they all nitrous spira dominate. They have much less of a role in other habitats. You will see members of the proteobacteria and actinobacteria in almost all habitats. But again, that has no real relation to metabolism because they're very diverse in their metabolic abilities. Next environment that we're going to move on to is the soil environment. The primary producers of most terrestrial environments are plants. These will be trees, grasses, bushes, etc. They will then rain their plant litter down onto the ground. This gets absorbed into the soil and then degraded. Soil is not just organic material, it's also sand and rock. There's also a large number of microbes, about a billion per gram, and the ratio of organic material and microbes and sand and rock depends upon the soil type. And we're not going to go into that in this class. You can take a soil science class if you're interested in that. A very important topic. Soil has aerobic and anaerobic zones, and the water content influences this. Drier soil will have smaller anaerobic zones. Wetter soil will have larger ones. And these anaerobic zones are normally in of the inside of a soil particle. Microbes present include bacteria, fungi, and protozoa, and you will also find archaea. The general players in the soil. Dominant phylotypes are consistent. If you look at any soil from any environment, you're going to find proteobacteria, actinobacteria, acidobacteria, and bacteroides in the soil. You'll find those four groups. You'll also find them almost everywhere. The relative abundance and major fauna found in each soil change depending upon the soil type, and this changes most importantly based upon the pH of the soil and the salinity of the soil, how much you know salt there is. Right? Those are the general players. Now, as we go through these environments, we're going to talk about various types of biopolymer degradation. Some of the major carbon sources available are from the plant material, and these biopolymers will be cellulose, which is the most common biopolymer on Earth, and lignin. So we're going to talk about how these are degraded. Cellulose is a major component of plants. It's 35 to 50 percent of the dry weight, and cellulose degrading microbes are very common, and they close the circle. Cellulose is a very recalcitrant molecule. It's difficult to degrade. But bacteria can degrade it. There's many aerobic bacteria and fungi that what they will do, you cannot take this giant cellulose molecule into your cytoplasm. What you do is you will secrete extracellular cellulases. And they come in three classes. Exogluconases that chew from the ends. Endogluconases that cut the internal amorphous regions that are not crystalline. Right, cholesterol and cellulose here, they really can't attack but they can attack these amorphous regions. And then beta-glucosidases that degrade the oligosaccharides. In any cases, these all get cut down to glucose and cellobios. These can be imported into the organism and then further degraded. There are also different cellulose degrading systems in anaerobic bacteria. Many anaerobic bacteria will produce what's called a cellulosome. And this has all the cellulose degrading molecules or enzymes on a scaffold. And this, sca and this scaffold is made of the scaffolding protein and it attaches to the cell wall and then the cellulose degrading enzymes attach to the scaffolding via Dockerin domains. You have a cellulose binding domain or carbohydrate binding domain that binds to the cellulose, brings this all in con close contact, and then this degrades it. Cellulosomes are more efficient because it keeps all the enzymes together, it keeps them close to the actual microorganisms that's making them, and then it therefore is a more efficient way of degrading cellulose. And so that has makes 
it an advantage for these anaerobic bacteria. The other major polymer that you find in soil environments is wood lignin. And if you look at the polymer, it seems to have a consistent structure containing a benzene group and then a glycerol group attached to the benzene. And this is methylated, and, but it seems to be put together in a random fashion. This is because of the way it's synthesized. And if you want to learn more about that, you can take a soil science class or a plant science where they talk about this. What we're concerned about is how lignin is degraded. And the major degraders of lignin are basidiomycetes, which are fungi, and also there are some bacteria. Basidiomycetes can be classified into two groups, white rot fungi, these are the most common ones that degrade wood. And probably one of the best examples is Furnier KD Chrysosporium. It's very well studied white rot fungus, and we're going to talk about its mechanism of degradation. There's also brown rot fungi and bacteria. They will use different pathways, but the best understood uses free radicals to degrade the lignin, and that's the one that we're going to talk about. So what happens is that Phenarchate chrysosporium will make lignin peroxidase, manganese peroxidase, and versatile peroxidases. What these do is they release peroxide radicals that then go in and attack and break apart the lignin. Remember that the lignin structure is somewhat random. Because of this, you can't just make an enzyme that's going to break a specific bond because there'll be random places that it isn't there. So instead, what these peroxidases do is make highly reactive species that degrade into hydroxide radicals. And these hydroxide radicals are little bombs that are thrown in to the lignin, react with it, and break it apart. And it will degrade into these reactive species that will go through further reactions and eventually result in the phenolics shown here at the bottom. These phenolics can then be imported in the cell and further degraded. Okay, so here's a question for you. Cellulosomes make degradation of cellulose highly efficient. This is because, and here are your choices. Lignin degradation is different than cellular degradation in that Okay, and the correct answer is C. The scaffolding of the enzymes and putting them together increases their local concentration and increases the rate of degradation. And the correct answer is again C. The lignin polymer is attacked, attacked by free radicals. Okay, last slide in this presentation. You have further degradation from there. So we've broken our biopolymers of cellulose and lignin down and we've made them into sugars and other types of molecules, phenolics. The process from there can be aerobic respiration, syntrophic metabolism, methanogenesis, or sulfate reduction. We will cover, we've covered aerobic respiration. Right? You basically funnel whatever you got here into pathways that lead to the citric acid cycle, or the TCA cycle also, or the Krebs cycle it's called, and then you get aerobic respiration from there. Under anaerobic environments, you can have syntrophic metabolism, methanogenesis, and sulfate reduction. And we will talk about the, those in future lectures. Okay, that's it for this one.